Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. Real quick, before we get started, you've been listening to us. Now we want to listen to you. Please go to gardennerd.com, that's G-A-R-D-E-N-E-R-D.com slash podcast hyphen survey to share your thoughts with us. Tell us more about who you are, and what you want to hear in an upcoming episode. Thank you very much, and now on with the show. Our guest this week is Charlotte Ecker Wiggins. She's a master beekeeper and educator throughout the Midwest. Charlotte has lectured on a variety of beekeeping-related topics over the years. Her book, The Beekeeper's Diary, is a must-have for anyone getting started. Welcome to the podcast, Charlotte. Hi, Christy. Appreciate being here. Yeah, sure. We know each other through GardenCom, and we're both part of a group of fiction writing that started a couple years ago. So we don't often talk about beekeeping as much as we do about writing and our businesses. What does your bee yard look like right now? Or, well, what does it look like in general? How many beehives do you keep? Okay, well, I have, I think, I say nine plus plus one or nine plus, you know, swarms or whatever, mm -hmm. but I keep bees on a Missouri limestone hillside. So think like a goat and you'll kind of get a sense for <laughs> what I'm doing. When I moved in here in 1982, all excited about building a house and having a garden, my neighbor said, Charlotte, nothing's going to grow here. So understand how far I've come. Now, most places, you know, you plant perennials, it's one, one year to root, one year to shoot, one year to fruit. Well, on my hillside, because soil is so hard to find, it can take 10 years for that perennial to go through that process that takes normally three years. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in the 40 years I've been here, I have turned this rugged hillside into a monarch way station. It is a certified wildlife refuge, and it's also a working apiary. Wow. That looks, that sounds like it's really a, uh abundant in lots of green and flowers is that oh absolutely no grass 65 dwarf fruit trees which is why I have I'm so excited to have your book because my fruit trees I have I have a lot of bonsai trees oh yeah it's not because I train them it's because their poor little roots are looking for you know uh, uh, sustenance I had a dogwood tree I planted here in 1985 and it took 20 years before Theodore started growing he was three feet tall for 20 years and I thought well I guess I'll never see a dogwood out of my living room window and then he finally took off so just take this is a different place to garden however I tell people if I can do it on this site guess what you can do it on your property yes and my most favorite place to garden is my pot garden years ago when I was traveling I couldn't I mix my vegetables and fruits in my garden anyway, but I couldn't train the lady who was helping me with watering the plants that were in the actual soil. So I started a series of pots on my deck. I still do that to this day. I have fresh herbs inside now, rosemary, uh, parsley. I have two tomato trees. I always bring tomato trees inside. So I have fresh tomatoes over winter. They have a south and a west facing windows so they obviously have the sun requirements that they need but I cannot live without living green things around me so the garden is both outside in the growing season which for us is March through about October and then I have more plants growing inside over the winter. Yeah and you had mentioned the last time we talked that you had snow on the ground already. Yes, we've had snow. It's all, it's gone now. It was just snow, no ice, which is uh, wonderful. It's when we have the ice combined with snow that it becomes really dangerous. But it was pretty big flakes fell. Two hours later, it was gone. I like okay. that. <laughs> Got it. So <laughs> here in Southern California, we don't batten down our beehives for winter. In fact, that's kind of the busy season for them because that's our that's our flowering time for most of most of winter and into spring. So what does it look like for you to batten down your hives for the winter? So we start in August. We start looking at what the high, the bee numbers are. We, we monitor for varroa mites, that little tick-like bug that takes out the immune system of the bees. And if we have to do something about that, the height of the varroa mites are in August. The bee numbers are starting to go down for winter, but the varroa mite 
numbers keep going up. So that August is a pretty critical time. That's also the time when the bees change from summer bees, which only live from eight, you know, six to eight weeks to winter bees. They have more vitagelin, and so they live for the six months it takes to pull the colony through winter. They don't hibernate, they cluster in a football size shape inside the hive, keeping the wax warm and the honey that they've stored as their winter food. So we start in August, we then equalize, we make sure in my, in my garden, I have bees for pollination, not necessarily for honey. So I make sure the bees all have the amount of honey that they will need. I will put two supers, I run eight frame hives because of the weight. I mean, a full 10 frame can weigh 75, 80 pounds. I just can't lift that. So I have the smaller hives, but I make sure they all have honey. They have at least two boxes, right? Medium drawers full of honey for winter. And then in October, I actually wrap them with a quilted black wrap that, that keeps moisture out. And to ensure that they, just in case the weather is really mild for the winter, I put sugar cakes. I make sugar cakes that I put on top, which help absorb the moisture, but also give them emergency food in case they run out of food. Mm -hmm. And then I make sure I keep, you know, I go out a week, every week or so, just to make sure that nobody's knocked anything over, the entrances are small and the bees are, I can feel where their bees are by putting my hand under the, the cover and making sure they're still there generating heat and being okay. That's so fascinating to me that the bees do that kind of thing. I mean, that you know, even as a beekeeper, and I've been doing this for five or six years, well, longer, I don't know. Anyway, I've lost track, but they, they just, they just um, have a, a, a way of keeping themselves as an organism all the time. You know, they just operate together all the time. And I always tell our students who want to come in and say they're they're going to tell their bees the what to do. And it's like, wait a minute, you're entering their world. I'm your coach, but your teacher are your bees. You need to listen, learn what they're doing, and incorporate what you want to do with them, not impose. Anybody who comes in and tries to impose themselves on their bees is doomed. It, it's just not going to work out. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. Never works out. And your book, The Beekeeper's Diary, it's honestly something I wish I had had when I started beekeeping because there's there's so many books out there that walk you through the process of getting started, but they leave out those really kind of intimate details that you included in yours. I've been highlighting so many tidbits through the book as I was reading through. And like you talk about how to clean your hive tool. I don't think I've run across that before or how to properly use your hive tool to open the hive so you don't crud up the corners. You know, I keep digging the corners out of my hive and I'm like, oh yeah, not supposed to do that. So it's stuff like that, that you, usually we have to sort of figure out on our own, but you put it in down on paper, which is really nice. So were these questions that you got from students along the way, or did you just have the presence of mind to write it down? Both. Actually, this is the book I wanted when I started beekeeping, <laughs> I couldn't find out there. And I, I, I would get so frustrated because there would be a little tidbit here or somebody would drop a nugget there. And then I, the, our extension office asked me to teach a beginning class because they were being asked for that and they didn't have anybody. And so I started writing those things down to pass on to the students. Well, it went from a couple of loose leaf papers to a loose leaf binder full of stuff. And then I thought, I hated putting those loose leaf binders together. I could never copy off the exact number of copies. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you think you've got it all organized and you're too short on some chapter. So it was easier to put it into a book, have the beginning book as being part of the workbook, mm -hmm. and then having the workbook have the checklists and the guides that we've used in class. And we still use that in our classes just got it certified by the Great Plains Master Beekeeping Program as a scientifically based best management practices. So you don't just have to take my word for it. It really is. I think I read 62 beginning beekeeping books. Wow. Just to get a sense of what was out there and what information was there. And there were excellent books, First Lessons in Beekeeping, an absolutely classic. I remember reading that, putting it down and going, now what? Well, <laughs> my book answers the now what, right? Got it's it. good to have all those theories and all those excellent books out there. And as a beekeeper, as you know, you're only as good as the last book you read. So it's important to be able to read those, but this is a practical book. This will 
you know, there's 14 decisions I think you need to make just to where you place your hive, you know, in your garden. And so that has a checklist and walks you through the options and pros and cons. I don't tell you what to do, but I give you the pros and cons because when you're starting, you don't know that. Yeah. And you know that you want to do this, but you don't know how. Speaking of pros and cons, you recommend starting with two colonies instead of one. Why is that? Because you learn faster. There, well, there's several reasons. You learn faster by comparison, right? You have context now, having that second hive. Oh, this hive is not as fast as this one, or the, these bees are flying strangely. You learn from that. If one hive is weaker than the other, you can borrow from the stronger hive and help shore up your weaker hive. I mean, beekeeping is an investment. I always tell people $700 in a freezer. That's what's gonna take you to get started. And the freezer part is not to be funny, but these days you need a freezer to put your frames in to store them from small high beetle larvae, from you know, all sorts of things. So the freezer becomes a really important tool. And if you're a family and you're all of a sudden you're sticking bugs and dead bugs and frames in your freezer, your family may leave you. So I just <laughs> say invest, invest in that freezer early on. You know, you can find some at yard sales. We're not talking about a fancy freezer, but just one with enough space that your frames can fit in. So that's why I say, start with two if you can. And now if you can't, I also am a big believer in the Bee Buddy system. And that is when you're going through our classes, we try to match you up with somebody else that lives close to you. So that if each one of you buys one colony, you go visit each other's colony and by comparison, learn. And then if one of you has a problem with your colony, you can borrow from your bee buddy and vice versa. Because beekeeping to me is really, it's not a solitary sport at all. You're gonna be successful because other beekeepers are helping and sharing. That's so smart. And I did use my, my, uh, I call it the kind of freezer you can bury the body in. You can hide the body in. Um, yeah, it's one yeah. of those, it's a half size. It's not a full size. So a small person, but anyway, I digress. Uh, uh, we had wax moths in a, in a, yeah. uh, a super and some frames that we were storing that we weren't using it. And we noticed that there were wax moths coming off of it. So we popped that in a, in a glad bag and put it in the freezer and it's, you know, left it there for a couple of weeks to, well, I don't know, we forgot about it for a while, but uh, do you have a specific length of time you like to leave them in there? Well, at least two days, yeah. depending on what you've got. But I, I always say just at least 40 hours or yeah. 70 is better. And if, if you're getting for a couple of weeks, you're not hurting them. Yeah. Kind of the same with seed saving. I tell people to put, put their seeds in the, in the freezer for three days to kill off or beans, you know, if they're harvesting dry right. beans, put those in the freezer for three days to kill off any weevils that might be in there. Um, Okay, so I have a question because, and this is totally personal and, you know, maybe no one else is doing this, but my hive is all medium supers, top to bottom. Uh, and, and but no one ever, you know, it was like, yeah, you can use mediums because they're lighter. But no one ever told me that three mediums equal two deeps, like you mentioned in the book. Is this common knowledge or did you figure that out? Well, I don't know how common it is, but if you think about it, it's the space, right? How much space they need, the bees need in the brood box, basically yeah. their house. And so the dimensions, I'm just generalizing here about dimensions, but if you only have deeps, use two deeps to make the brood, brood box, the, the bee house. If you have mediums, you can do a deep and a medium. Mm -hmm. Or in my case, cause I also have uh, all mediums. I run mostly all mediums three mediums they equal the space that the bees need for their home and then you need to be adding space right when their numbers are growing and people tend to stick a box on top and call that good and i'm going no no the space needs to be in the bee space right their bee home so it needs to be over those three or the two or wherever you have the the brood nest right the brood box the three boxes two boxes that's where you add space you don't add space on top because the next couple boxes or honey boxes, right? They're putting extra food in there. So you don't put it on top. You put it over where the nest is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just like this one, there's so many really nifty tips in here, like how to use hairpins to hold wax foundation in place. You can talk about using a magnet in an unexpected way. Can you share <laughs> that? I thought that was so great. Oh, are you talking about the magnet in your, in your, your pocket? Yes. So slap your hive tool on. Do you know how many hive tools I've lost over the years? 
it, they don't grow, by the way, when you plant them in your garden. But that <laughs> way, you know, you, you can find it because it will stick to that magnet in your pocket and you won't lose as many. That's so smart. Cause my, I told my husband and he's like, that's such a great idea. He's like, but you have pockets. I'm like, yeah, but then they get all sticky and weird inside. Yeah, exactly. It's so smart. Uh, and now you have another trick that you talk about again, I didn't know about this, so maybe it's common knowledge and I just haven't read the right book, but you talked about using a one-to-one -one sugar syrup to get bees to take to empty frames. I'd never heard of that before. Yes. Yes, because you think about one to one is very similar to flower nectar. Mm -hmm. Flower nectars vary in how sweet they are, when they're produced, and whatever, but it's a very similar type of sweet product, carbohydrates for bees. And if if they are not in the right time, right, they don't have the right temperatures, at the nature outside is not producing the nectar, which activates their 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 wax producing glands you can put the sugar water on that empty frame and they will think that they're bringing nectar in and that will activate their wax producing glands and they'll start produce, putting wax on the foundation. So you're talking about putting it basically in a spray ball and just kind yeah. of spraying yeah. the high. Yeah. And, and do you do that? Do you do that in just the frames that you want honey in or do you do that on brood frames too? I want wherever I want wax, you wherever. know, wax is more valuable than the honey. And so I, I've, I take very good care of my wax frames because of that. It takes eight pounds of honey to make a pound of wax. And so wherever I want wax, I will use the spray. That is so clever. <laughs> I feel like such a newbie talking to you, even though I'm like, I've been doing this for a while, but I, I honestly fall into a little bit into the category of bee haver because we don't, we don't really go in and inspect brood and look for the queen very often we don't I mean we don't I don't know if we ever do but because that's kind of their space and they've sealed it up we don't want to mess it up for them so that's kind of my take on things but as we're looking for hive beetles and checking for you know distorted wings or anything like that that might indicate varroa mites but uh what's your take on uh you know that approach rather than getting in there and really working the hive well, I don't believe in working the hive because you're disturbing the way they've got the hive set up, but I do believe in monitoring the hive. So I monitor mine every month for Varroa and I monitor the brood nest. I don't look for the queen. As long as I see eggs, I know she's laying, but I monitor for space. As long as she has room to lay, then I know she's okay. It's when she starts running out of room that, that you then prompt them to pack up their suitcases and swarm, right? So I go in there and during our swarm season, which here is, it can be every, anywhere from March to July, I will check them maybe every 10 days, seven to 10 days, depending on how the nectar flow is going, because they can fill up a super in a week on a good nectar flow. So I wanna make sure, I don't worry so much about how much honey they've got, but I make sure that those bottom three or two boxes where their queen is and, the, and she's laying eggs, she has room to lay. That to me is the critical part. So I probably would do a little more than you do, but I would monitor that brood nest. nest. I wouldn't worry about finding the queen. If you can see the eggs, you know she's laying. Right. And you need to monitor for Varroa to make sure that you catch them early. The, they just changed the, the, the recommendation for varroa treatment. It used to be one every one varroa per 100 bees or three, three varroa per. Now they're saying you have one per 100 bees. You need to do something. Okay. And I do not use chemicals in my hives. I'm, I've, I have used oxalic acid, which is a natural compound. And I've used formic, which is another natural. But I will do the things that help keep the hive safe. I have hygienic queens, varroa sensitive queens that I buy mm -hmm. to make sure that they are taking care of it themselves. I will remove drone brood in April. The poor little guys, I love drone bees, but the, they, the, that's where varroa liked because they've got space. The drone broods are the big, you know, drones are the biggest. Yeah. And they don't do anything. <laughs> well, they sit around, you know, watching TV and drinking beer and, and, and mating with the queen. Right. They have 50% of the genetics mm -hmm. of the colony, which are important. But if I don't need drones, I will remove the drone frames, put them in the freezer, and then bring them out, and let the bees clean them up. Because that's where the varroa 
are growing, right? They're hatching inside the, the drone brood. I'll keep my colonies small. I really don't want to have humongous colonies because that just encourages varroa and it's hard to manage. And then if I do need to do something, I'll do something like a formic acid strip or oxalic acid because I don't want to use apivar or those more artificial chemicals. I just don't believe in that. And I don't, I don't use chemicals in my garden, never have. So I'm not going to add chemicals to my bees. Now I'm going to ask you a question. And if you don't know the answer to this, you can say so, but I, it's the thing that kind of boggles my mind is that how can drones be born without a father? I know, isn't that hilarious? <laughs> I don't understand. My brain can't wrap around it. Well, I had to call my genetic brother. Mm -hmm. he, he's a geneticist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and said, how come my drone, my, my boy bees only have grandfathers? And he said, well, and you know, he goes into this thing. I, to this day, I don't know the answer, Can't but I know who to ask if you really want to okay. know. <laughs> so, because it's for, for people who aren't familiar with this, listeners, uh, drones are eggs laid by the queen that have not been fertilized. And I'm like, how does that even happen? I don't even understand that. So it's sort of a mystery to me. And the genetic ex explanation is out there. I just can't retain it enough to summarize. Yeah, and it's hard to summarize. It really is a complicated answer. All right, well, it is tip time. Back to stuff we can talk about. <laughs> what, um, what other great tips do you have that you'd like to share with the Garden Nerd audience? Absolutely for gardeners. And I say this every time I lecture on planting for pollinators is if you don't know your soil type, you are wasting your time and money. Mm. Get a soil test. Your university extension office around the country can get those. You can go online and find those. Don't go to your home and garden center and get a little soil test or those don't work. Get a real honest to goodness soil test. It'll tell you a couple of things. It'll tell you what kind of soil you have. Are you in the middle ground? Are you too acid? Are you on the sweeter side? That will then narrow down the kinds of plants that you can plant, right? The kinds of plants that will successfully grow in that kind of soil. And if let's say you wanna grow blueberries, and you tell them, I want to be able to grow, grow, grow blueberries here. They'll tell you how to amend your soil to grow blueberries. I do a soil test every three years because I, I as I said, I don't have grass. I let nature deliver the leaves. I'm actually hauling leaves from our recycling center back here to make sure some of my favorite flower beds are nicely covered for winter. Seriously, nature's providing all of that. Why are we making it more difficult? right? Just embrace that and then just monitor it to make sure that you're not getting too acid, right? Depending on what you want to grow. And I also am a big native planter. I have beautiful Eastern red buds, which are native to across North America. And they have been growing here for many years. Now they're very mature in the springtime. This looks like a pink haze, you know, around the garden. It's just lovely. So Two things, make, get your soil test and plant native because your native plants are going to be more acclimated to that soil. And they also have a relationship with your native bees. And they sometimes, they are the ones that are endangered. Honeybees are not endangered. Native bees are the ones that need the help. Right. And, and I've always told my, my own students it, that getting a soil test is like driving with your eyes open because yes. otherwise you have them closed and you're proceeding forward with, with blindness. <laughs> Oh, I like that. That's very yeah. good. Well, you know, you're going to be more successful. Yeah. Because totally. you're matching, right? You're like a matchmaker. You're matching the right plant to the right, right type of soil. And all of a sudden, all those brown thumbs out there will disappear because all of a sudden they're doing the right, making the right combinations. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte, for that great tip. And all of the others that you've been sharing inside the Beekeeper's Diary. Is that the book that won an Epi? The, is it the Ippy? I forget. Yeah. It, it's won several international publishing awards, but yes, in the home and garden and the how-to category. So that's nice to know that the way I'm thinking and trying to help people has been recognized as a good, good product. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. And I can't wait to read through the rest of it. I got partway, I got most of the way through, but I, before our interview, but I'm going to read the rest all the way through to the end because I'm learning so much. So good. thank you so much. And how do people find you? Where's the best way for them to find you? Well, of course, I'm on most 
uh, bookstores have it available, but I also, I have Bluebird Gardens as my gift company, and you'll get an autograph copy by going to bluebirdgardens.com. I also have a second book for those of you who want to start a bee club called Bee Club Basics. And then the third book will be out this spring called Bees Need Flowers, Planting for Pollinators. These are three reference books that are currently not available on the market, which is why I'm writing them, because I know people could use these books and, and appreciate them. So Amazon has them as an ebook. For those of you who like ebooks, they have them for an ebook on both books. And those are $24.95. And then the, the print books are $34.95. And are you on social media anywhere? I am. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. I'm not sure about Twitter. Bluebird. Charlotte Ecker Wiggins under Instagram, Facebook. Also, I have both an author page and my personal page. Follow the personal page because I post something every day. When I was catching a swarm, I picked up two kittens somebody dumped in the county so James is <laughs> Ness and his, his sister Etta they're hilarious and so I post an adventure that they have you know every Saturday on Catterday so I want people to learn you know I'll put little tips when I post things like I just cut some pussy willows down to put them on a flower arrangement on a table and in a couple of weeks I'll have flowers that come out and that's a nice way to have flowers over Thanksgiving and then if I leave them long enough they'll root so have new new plants to put outside. So fantastic. All right, garden nerds, you'll find a link to Charlotte's book, The Beekeeper's Diary at uh, gardennerd.com this week. We'll also post links to her social media feeds and her TEDx talk. So you can get a load of that as well. And uh, we'll link to her other books too. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardennerd.com. Show your support for this podcast and the other free stuff on Garden Nerd by becoming a Patreon subscriber. You'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as GardenNerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!